appreciable when it came to the personality trait, when it came to their services of the Islam. So that's why even when you see um, the way Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam would refer himself, the way Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam would refer themselves, they would, also, they would always make this connection of themselves with Hamza. They would always make their connection of themselves with Jaffa. So you would see like, you would only make the connection of yourself with someone who's esteemed. You would only make it who is respectable. If someone is not really respectable, if someone doesn't carry high position within the Islam, then obviously a person like you and me wouldn't try to associate ourselves with them. Let alone Ahl al-Bayt they would always try to associate themselves with Ja'far. So Ja'far was being martyred in one of the battle called Battle of Mauta. And that was a really decisive battle that Muslims fought against um, the Byzant uh, against the Roman Empire, sorry, of that time. And this battle happened on the outskirts of um, the Arabia and the Syrian Peninsula, right? So it was a little bit towards the borderline between these two areas. So Ja'far bin Abi Talib alayhi salatu was being killed and he was being killed in a way that both of his hands were being taken off and then he was being killed after the enemies attacked him. That's why he's called what? Tayyar. Tayyar means someone who flies, right? Why? Because, because both of his hands were being taken off. So Allah gave him a special power within the Jannah that he, like the other angels, would fly within the Jannah wherever they want. And this is a symbolic language. Obviously, we cannot understand what does fly means and what does those, um, you know, like what does tayyar means and all these things. But just for, you know, just to make it simple, just to highlight a little bit of the fadila that Ja'far bin Abi Talib was given. So it was important for me just to go through the name of Ja'far, why the name of Ja'far is so important, right? Like we do have the name Muhammad, we do have the name Ali, we do have the name Hassan within the Ayma alayhi salam, but some of the really prominent names are different. So Jafar is one of them and Musa is one of them, right? The other names are pretty much repetitive. Um, so this was a brief background of who Jafar was. Now Jafar, Imam Jafar al Sadiq. Um, the father of Imam Jafar was obviously, as we know, was Imam Muhammad al Baqir alayhi salatu was salam. And the name of his mother was Umm Farwa, Umm Farwa, right? So generally, uh, when it comes to us, um, we Shias generally, uh, we generally don't have a good grasp and good understanding of the names of the Imams, their mother names, right? Um, so if let's suppose if someone asks you randomly, who was the mother of Imam Qadim alayhi salatu wasalam? then probably we, don't, we won't have an answer because why? Because we generally don't get this information when even when we go to Majlis. So I think it is important for us to have a little bit of information when it comes to the names of the mothers of our blessed Imams and also to know a little bit about them. Who were they? Why were they so respectable? What were, what were the qualities that they had? And all those things, right? So Umm Farwa uh, was the name of the mother of Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam. Now who was Umm Farwa? You know, a little, little bit about her too. Umm Farwa was the daughter of Qasim. And who was Qasim? Qasim was the son of Muhammad bin Abi Bakr. So see like Muhammad bin Abi Bakr, shall I don't want to um, transgress a lot from the main lecture. But Muhammad bin Abi Bakr was a really respectful personality for the Shia Islam. He was so respectful that even though he was the son of first caliph, the first caliph, the, the we Shias, we despite them, right? Even then, Muhammad bin Abi Bakr was someone that Amir al-Mumin alayhi salatu wasalam took care of. You know, right from the beginning, right from the small age, Amir al-Mumin used to take care of him. And obviously, since Amir al-Mumin was the one that took care of him, Amir al-Mumin was the one that nourished him. So Muhammad bin Abi Bakr, obviously, when he was uh, when he uh, was Balir and when he started uh, his career, um, he was one of those that used to love Ahl al-Bayt profusely, right? And this was the love of Ahl al-Bayt that led to his martyrdom in Misr, in Egypt. And he was being killed in a really heinous way, in a really bad way, right? Uh, he was killed in a way that, you know, like he was taken under the skin of a donkey. And after taking an, in the height of the donkey, 
they burned the hide of the donkey along with Muhammad bin Abu Bakr. Why? Because he loved Ahlul Bayt al Muslim. Why? Because he loved Amir al Mu'mineen. Why? Because he despised the enemies of Ahlul Bayt al Muslim. So always remember that we don't judge the people by their lineage, we judge the people by their aqidah. We judge the people by their actions. We judge the people by the way they love Ahl bayt and by the way they despise or they hate the enemies of Ahl bayt So always one lesson that we can take from the blessed lineage of Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam is always, always, always have love of Ahl bayt within yourself. And when I say love, it means it should be displayed through the actions and always have the hatred of the enemies of Ahl bayt be it the enemies that destroyed the house of Sayyidah Zahra, be it the enemies that led to the killing of Amir al-Mu'mineen, be it the enemies that came in after him, right? So all of these enemies are negative figure for all she of us, right? So this was a brief background of who was the mother of Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, and then Imam Sadiq, his kunya, uh, like we say, Ya Abul Hassan for Amir al Mu'mineen, for Abul Hassan is for Amir al Mu'mineen, we say Abu Muhammad for Imam Hassan, the kunya of Amir al uh, Imam Sadiq was Abu Abdullah, right? Remember this name. Abu Abdullah was his kunya, so whenever you go through the books of literature, books of uh, history, books of the hadith, and if you come across Qala Abu Abdullah, so generally it means Imam Sadiq. The way Imam Hussein's kunya was Abu Abdullah too. So Imam Sadiq shared the same kunya like that of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wassalam. So now, one of the really important lakab of Imam Sadiq was, and obviously I'm saying it, it's Sadiq al -Qawm. Someone who would always speak truth, right? We do have people um, that will always speak truth, obviously. All of our I'm alayhi salam were all truthful. And they are among the, among the Sadiqin in Quran. So there's no doubt that all of them were Sadiq. But generally, the reason we say Sadiq, there might be so many reasons, but one of the reasons is that our fiqh, right? Our fiqh is not called fiqh al -Bakari. Our fiqh is not called fiqh al -Abidi. Our fiqh is not called fiqh al -Kadmi. Our fiqh is called what? Fiqh al -Jafariya. Or al madhab al -Jafariya, right? So our fiqh or our whole madhab is associated with which personality? With Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam. So you can understand that how important was it for the people around that time that Imam Sadiq is the one that is propagating the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, right? He is the one who is responsible for telling all the masla. He's the one who's answering all the questions. He's the one that's narrating the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. He's the one that's quoting the ayat. He's the one that's quoting the hadith of the Prophet. So that personality could only be trusted if the personality is truthful, if he doesn't lie for even minutest of thing, if he is really impeccable. If all of these qualities are within one personality, that personality was called what? Sadiqu Ali Muhammad. Someone within the progeny of Ali Muhammad, which cannot be parallel, which cannot be matched when it comes to speaking the truth. Right? So that's why. He was called what? Sadiq Ali Muhammad. Like within the progeny of Ali Muhammad, the one who is really truthful. Because of he being the most truthful, or because he was always speaking the truth. So the madhab that came from him, the teachings that came from him, the hadith that came from him, the jurisprudence that came from him, the tafsir that came from him, all of it is only and only the truth. Nothing is false from it, right? So one of the significance of this title, Sadiq Ali Muhammad, is that we associate ourselves, our madhab, our fiqh is associated with whom? With Imam Sadiq, alayhi salatu wassalam. So that's one understanding. Um, and there are other understandings too, but inshallah, we'll move forward uh, because obviously we uh, have to go through a little bit about the history of Imam too. Now, before we go into the history, one or two things that we can take from his life and it is important for us uh, because I think we are living in West and it's a little bit easier for all of us that, you know, like we know that the people that might be living in India, that might be living in Pakistan, uh, you would see that inflation has gone a little bit higher. Not a little bit higher, it has gone a lot, right? 
even the people here in Canada are feeling a little bit difficult to go through their monthly expenses, right? Uh, likewise, the situation in Pakistan and India are worse, right? The situations there, right? My only um, lesson to you would be just to be a little bit generous, just to share a little bit of your wealth with the people that are really, really needy. You know, and we can see how, how Imam Sadiq did. You know, one time a person, he went for Hajj. So when generally when people would go for Hajj, Hajj they do in Mecca. And when they would go for Hajj, obviously they're going to the Mecca. They would also try to come to Medina too. So they, the person went for Hajj and he came to Medina too. While he was praying in Masjid al-Nabawi and Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was there too. So he had a bag, that bag contained 100 gold coins. So that bag was with him and he was praying, right? Suddenly after he was done with the prayers, he figured out that he couldn't find that bag that contained 1,000 gold coins. Now 1,000 gold coins are a lot of money, right? It is, um, if you go through the present time, it might be, you know, like roughly around 50, 60,000 dollars, right? Maybe more than that. So, so much money he was carrying with himself and obviously he's praying and that he cannot find him. Now, when he went to look for the money, he found Imam Shadiq alayhi salatu wasalam sitting in. And obviously Imam Shadiq alayhi salatu wasalam was worshipping too. Now, when he come up, came across Imam Shadiq, he said, did you take the money? You are the one that took the money. You know, just like saying it in a really affirmative way that you were the one that took my thousand, that you were the one that took my bag. He said this. Imam Sadiq said, how much money was in that bag? He said, it contained 1,000 gold coins. 1,000 gold coins, right? So Imam Sadiq said, okay, if that's the situation, he asked one of his servants to get one of the, one of the more, one, another bag, and that bag contained 1,000 gold coins too. So Imam Sadiq took that bag, and he gave that bag to the person, even though Imam Sadiq, alayhi salatu wasalam, could have said, I didn't take your money. And when I didn't take your money, obviously I'm not liable for, I'm not liable to give you one single penny, right? But Imam Sadiq, you know, he had this vision of helping the poor people, helping anyone who was in the need. Imam Sadiq looked at it and was just thinking that probably if he wouldn't find his bag, he wouldn't have anything with him. So Imam gave him handsome amount of money, right? Thousand gold coins, right? And then the person went back to the place where he was worshiping and he found the bag. He found the original bag that he was looking for. Now he has his own thousand gold coins and the thousand gold coins that Imam gave him. Now he was feeling really embarrassed. He came back to Imam Sadiq. He apologized for his behavior. And he said, Mola, not the Mola, Mola is my way of saying, obviously he didn't understand who is Imam. He said that, please take the money back. And I'm really sorry, I got my bag back back and um, I'm really sorry I uh, thought that it was you that took it. Imam Sadiq said that whenever we Bayt, we give something we don't take it back. So that thousand gold coins are with you. I don't need it back. So you see like you know in these difficult scenarios in these difficult situations right it was Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam who would help the poor people Sometimes you would think that they might not be really poor, but if they're asking you for any help, and if you can help with even $20, even $30, even $40, right? That might just bring some joy to the family. That might just bring some little food towards their family, right? So for my youngsters, that you might not have a lot of money, but you might just get a little bit of pocket money too. So instead of spending pocket money for two days or three days, you can save them and then you can donate to the people that are really worthy, that are really going through hard situations. That's just one lesson that we can go through. A, re a second lesson too, like generally, um, you know, during the economic times and that happened in the COVID times too. When COVID happened, people were taking all the stock from the grocery stores and they were holding it, they were taking it in their homes, right? So generally when you would go for groceries, you would barely find any stuff, right? The, uh, you know, the famously they would say the, the tissue papers, the napkins, and all of these things, when you would go and try to buy those things, they were not there in the grocery stores, right? 
And the people were taking the food supplies, people were taking all kinds of things with them. And they were thinking that because of COVID, uh, there won't be, uh, grocery stores won't be open, the food supplies wouldn't come in from other countries. So hoard as much as we can. Hoarding means like collect as much money, as much supplies as we can in our home. And you know what it does? So if you have all the stuff in your home and if you start holding this thing is in, in your home, right? Then there is shortage of supply. When there's a shortage of supply for the things, automatically the prices of the things, they go really high. And a time might come in that barely people that generally want those things and they don't have those things at their home, they wouldn't even find one single item of it in the grocery stores, right? It happens a lot. It happens a lot, right? Same thing happened one time in Medina, you know, there was food shortage and the food shortage was specifically for the wheat. You know, we use wheat uh, to make rotis, you know, uh, the bread. So at that time there was shortage of food supply and people were holding the wheat and all these kind of food supplies in their home. So Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he asked his servant that how much wheat do we have? He said, Mola, we have enough wheat with us that could take us throughout this food shortage time. You know, so he already had that much of it. So Imam said, no, we would not hoard it and we would not assemble it in our home. Imam took the wheat out and you know, he sold all the wheat. And then he said that we would live as a poor person of the Medina would live. Whatever they will eat, we will eat the same food. If they are eating the barley bread, we would eat the barley bread. If they are eating the wheat bread, we will eat the wheat bread. So here you see Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam had the opportunity to take the wheat and to, you know, to even sell it with handsome amount. But he did with the market value, whatever the market value was. And he supported the poorest person of the Medina at that time because they didn't have the access to this wheat. They didn't have access to the food supplies. By Imam alayhi salatu wasalam supplying the food supplies at that moment, he was able to help the poor community of the Medina at that time. So two of the lessons, two of the stories that I quoted were important for all of us to understand that how important it is for us to help the common poor person of the society, to help the poor, poor people back in Pakistan, back in India, back in Africa, wherever you are coming from. The people really need the food there. Sometimes they don't have enough money. Sometimes they don't have enough food even to have it for one day, you know? So by helping them, you can actually follow the example of Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. So these were a little bit about the ikhlaqi uh, lessons that we can take. So going back again to the history of Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. So what happened was that Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he was born in 83 Hijrah, 17th of Rabi Awal. He spent 12 years of his life with Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salatu wasalam, who was martyred on 25th of Muharram, 95 Hijrah. Then after this, he spent roughly around 19 years with Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, alayhi salatu wasalam. Uh, he spent around like, um, so from all the way from 25th of Muharram to 7th of Dhul Hajj, 114th Hijrah. So 19 years he spent with his father, Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. And within this time, they would go and they would visit some of the Umayyad rulers. And whatever Imam Muhammad al-Baqir has to go through, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam was part and parcel of it. After the martyrdom of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam, he, his Imam period was for roughly around 34 years. So 34 years is big time. Generally the Imams, uh, not a lot of Imams, they got the opportunity to have this much Imam period of them. Even Imam Hussain, he had roughly around 10 to 12 years, depending on the history. Imam Hassan, his Imam period, or the time he was ruling, or the time he was taking care of the affairs of the Muslim, were generally like nine to 11 years. Likewise, Imam Zain al-Abideen was a little bit longer, but Imam Muhammad al-Baqir was 19 years, but Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was 34 years. 34 years is a lot, right? 34 years, he was taking care of the fears of the Muslims, right? 
within this time, he has to go through a lot of, there were a lot of changes that were going through the Islamic empire, right? So when he started his imamate, um, Bani Umayya were ruling at that time. So you would hear about Bani Umayya and Bani Abbas. So Bani Umayya, it included the people that were from the progeny of Umayya, from Quraysh. Bani Abbas, Abbas is whom? Abbas was the uncle of Prophet, was uncle of Amir al-Mumin. So he was the chacha of Rasulullah, chacha of Amir al-Mumin. So Abbas was the son of Abdul Muttalib, right? Within his progeny, he had a son, Abdullah, and Abdullah has a son, Ali, and Ali has a son. It goes further and further, right? So within this progeny, within this lineage, you would have Banu Abbas emerging from this lineage, right? And then you have versus Banu Abbas. Banu Abbas were from Banu Hashim too. From Banu Abbas, they had rivalry with against whom? Against Banu Fatima. Inshallah, I'm going to discuss this one a little bit more. But let's go through the Bani Umayyah history first, right? So when Imam started his Imamad, Hisham bin Abdul Malik bin Marwan was the one that was ruling the Islamic lands. So Hisham bin Abdul Malik was a really brutal ruler, was a really tyrant ruler, and he was responsible for killing a lot of Shias, right? Let me just look at the time, sorry. It's 26. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't have the uh, watch with me. So. Bani, uh, Hisham bin Abdul Malik was the one that was ruling Bani Umayyah at that time when Imam, Sa'd, uh, Imam Sa'diq alayhi salatu wasalam started his imamate. He was really brutal against the Shias, against all the progeny of Ahl Bayt al Muslim. And it's the same time, you know, people say around 120, 122nd Hijrah, Zayd bin Ali, Zayd al-Shaheed, right? He rose up against the tyrant of his time. So Zayd al-Shaheed, he went to Damascus, he went to Damascus, he went to the courtyard of the ruler. And there he was being mistreated by Sham bin Abdul Malik. You know, he wasn't allowed to come into the courtyard for two or three days. And then finally, when he came in, he saw something really disturbing. He even saw someone abusing Sayyid Fatima Salamullah. You know, the position of the Bani Umayyad, it got so worse that they were even abusing Janab Zahra Salam So when he listened to it, he came back and now he has vengeance within his heart. He wants to get the revenge of whatever happened with Imam Hussein. He wants to get the revenge of the uh, Tawheen that was done of Sayyidah Zahra Salam he wants to get the revenge of the atrocities that were committed against Ahl Bayt So he revolted and he, along with the people in Kufa, they stepped up and they wanted to take the revenge from Bani Umayya at that time. So what happened was that when they started doing the revolution against Bani Umayya, they were obviously, Zed had the support a little bit initially, but then the governor of Kufa, you know, just know a little bit of history. The governor of the Kufa was Yusuf bin Umar. Yusuf bin Umar cracked down against the Zayd and his supporters. So Zayd was being martyred really brutally. His supporters were being killed too. And Zayd was buried in one of the bank of the river, one of the land that was in the bank of the river Euphrates. Uh, he was being buried there. And even then, you know, Bani Umayya, they took out the body from the grave. Now imagine, like, you see the hostility that they had against Ahl Bayt salam, that they took out the body of Zed, knowing that Zed is the grandson of whom is the grandson of Imam Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. He is the son of Imam Zayn al -Abdin. He is one of a really huge figure Within the progeny of Ahl Bayt, but they took out the body of Zayd. They beheaded the body of Zayd. So his head was being sent to Damascus. His body was being burned then. So you can imagine how much atrocities were being committed against this person, against Ahl Bayt. So Sham bin Abdul Malik was really firm against Ahl Bayt generally. So Imam Sadiq, that period of time that he has to go through was difficult was really difficult. And then afterwards, Bani Umayyah, they had to face a lot of revolutions from different people. So at that time, because of whatever happened with Zayd, because of whatever they did in Karbala against Imam Hussein, 
because of whatever they were committing atrocities, whatever crimes that they were committing against other people, the people, they rose up against Banu Umayyah and they started supporting Banu Hashim. But they were trying to support Banu Hashim. Why? Because they wanted to get the caliphate, the rulership to the rightful people, to Banu Fatima. Banu Fatima were whom? They were from the progeny of Janab Zahra, from Amir al Mumin and Janab Zahra, be it from the lineage of Imam Hassan or be it from the lineage of Imam Hussein. So people wanted to give the rulership to whom? To either to the sons of Imam Hassan or to the sons of Imam Hussain. But what happened was that Banu Abbas, they supported the revolution too against Banu Umayyah. So as I told, Banu Abbas are not the Fatimites are not the son of Amir al Mumin. They are the son of Abbas, Abdullah bin Abbas, and the list goes downwards, right? They supported too, and they were against Banu Umayyah too. And what happened that what there was, uh, there were two primary journals um, that were really, really significant when it came to, when it came against the revolution of Banu Umayyah. One of them was Abu Muslim al Khorasani in Iran, and the other one was Abu Salama in Iraq. So Abu Muslim al Khorasani, he did what? That he rose up against the Banu Umayyah in Iran and the southern part of Iraq. And he basically live, you know, gave them the liberty. And those areas were liberated, and those areas came under his rulership. And from here, Abu Salama, he was responsible to take care of the uh, affairs of the Arab lands, right? So finally, Banu Abbas they came in and the promise was that they would give the rulership to whom? They would give the rulership to you, either for, to the sons of Imam Hassan or either to the sons of Imam Hussein. But when they came in, you know, the promise was there, but they broke the promise. So this is what the politics is. And this is really significant lesson that we need to understand. You know, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam never supported Banu Abbas against Banu Umayyah. Why? Because the Imam knew that if I would support them, they are the one that would commit same crimes too. So I don't want to be responsible for the crimes that they're committing. Secondly, the promise that they are making that when they would get the caliphate, when they would get the rulership, they would transfer it to Banu Hassan or Banu Hussein or from the Fatimites. This is just a really stupid and false promise. They would never want to give it back once they have it. So that's why both Abu Muslim al Khorasani, remember the two names, both Abu Muslim al Khorasani and Abu Salama, they both sent letters to Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam asking him to support the revolution that was happening. Why? Because Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he had huge following. Obviously, there were so many scholars that were coming and uh, studying under him. There were so many other people that were, uh, you know, that he had control over. But Imam, you know, one of the letter came in and Imam took the letter and he burned the letter. And he said, this is my reply to the person. Why was this reply to the person like this? Because Imam knew the methods that they're using to get the ruler rulership the matters methods that they're employing and obviously those matters were brutal too you know what Banu Abbas did Banu Abbas they did when they got hold of the Islamic lands when they were the rulers of this whole Islamic government right they went to the bodies of Banu Umayyah they dig the graves of Banu Umayyah they took out the leftovers of Banu Umayyah and they burned the bodies of Banu Umayyah too this was this is not the way of Ahl Bayt Salam. Ahl Bayt, if they would be even fighting in the battle, and if they are fighting in the battlefield, if they would kill someone, they would not disrespect the body of the deceased. But see, this is what Banu Abbas was doing too. And then Banu Abbas came in. The first ruler was Safar. He ruled for four years. So Banu Abbas, after Hisham bin Abdul Malik went, there were roughly around four more rulers that came in. One of them was Walid bin Yazid, then it was Yazid bin Walid, then it was Ibrahim ibn Walid, then the last ruler was Marwan ibn Himar, Marwan ibn Muhammad. He was being killed by Banu Abbas on 132 Hijrah, and then from 132 Hijrah, Banu Abbas, they got the rule. So first ruler was Safah, and he ruled for four years. So 
this number of years after Sham bin Abdul Malik and the first ruler of Banu Abbas, this was the time when Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam got a really good opportunity to propagate the message of Islam, to propagate the message of Ali Bayt. So he would obviously would tell the true teachings. He would have a huge circle of scholars coming and um, you know getting the guidance and getting the learning from him. So this was the time when Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam was able to dispatch the knowledge of Ali Bayt. It was able to dispatch the knowledge of Quran and Prophet, the true knowledge, and Finally, 136, Mansur al Dawaniqi came in. Now, this Mansur al Dawaniqi, uh, his, uh, you know, he was a really, really tyrant. He was brutal, a volume, an oppressor, right? When he came in, he was responsible for so many crimes that happened against the progeny of Ahl Bayt and against Imam himself. You know, some of the scholars say Imam was being rounded up seven times in prison. You know, we would hear about Imam Qadim going to the prison, but Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu was salam too. He was taken into the prison seven times in his lifetime. Seven times his lot, right? Seven times he was being taken into the prison. And then his house was burned too. So Mansur al Dawaniki, he wrote to his governor of Medina in Mecca. His name was Hassan bin Zaid, probably, if I remember correctly. He was being sent to go and destroy the house of Imam Sadiq, and not only destroy it, but burn the whole house. So he was being instructed to burn the house of Imam Sadiq, alayhi salatu wasalam, the same house that Ahlul Bayt would use as a sanctuary, that the families of Ahlul Bayt would reside in. You know, you would go to their houses and you would say, Assalamu alaikum ya Ahlul Bayt al But here, he dispatched a whole army doing this. You know what happened when this army was being dispatched and when all these things happened, you know, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he came from the burning, uh, burning flames. And when he came out from those burning flames, he was calling Ana ibn Ibrahim that I am the son of Ibrahim, who was the friend of Allah, who was really close to Allah. The way Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, was being saved from the fire, same way I am being saved from the fire that was put on my house. So see, Mansur of Dawaniki, he was a really, really tyrant ruler. And finally, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, he lived his life all the way from, um, all the way to 148 Hijrah. And finally, on 15th of Shawwal or 25th of Shawwal, one of these two dates, uh, he was being given poison in the form of grapes. So they put on the poison, they, um, they put it in, in the grapes, and then they gave those grapes to Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. And after eating those grapes, obviously, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam was, you know, like he left this world and he left this world in a situation that one of the narrators says that when I came and I visited Imam Sadiq after he was being given the poison, I could see his body and that body was so weak that i could just feel that there were only bones in it there were no flesh left within it so you see like how did they mistreat it imams of anybody and how brutally they try to deal with it and with this we pray allah almighty that ya allah please make us among the closest companions of imam sahib al-zaman the way the companions, you know, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam has some close companions too, has some close, you know, pupils too. One of them were Jabir bin Hayyan. You know, you can go and talk to the people and you can tell them, like, see, we believe that the father of the chemistry that we say Jabir bin Hayyan was actually the student of whom was actually the student of Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. And whenever he would refer to Imam Sadiq, he would say, Sayyidi Ja'far bin Muhammad, then my master, Ja'far bin Muhammad. So see, this is, you know, this is a batch that we should have it within ourselves, that this is a batch that we take, that Imam Sadiq, you know, the people that are going through chemistry, they probably would know about Jabir bin Hayyan, but none would know who was the teacher of Jabir bin Hayyan. And likewise, Imam had a really bright students. Some of them included Zawara, some of them included Hisham bin Saleh, Hisham bin Hakam, Abu Basir, Muhammad bin Muslim, Murayda bin Ma'abiyah, Ma'abiyah bin Ammar, 
all of these students were really bright and they were responsible for carrying the message of Ahl Bayt So may Allah make us among the closest student and among the closest companion of the Imam of our time. And inshallah, may Allah bless you all with a lot of knowledge. You know, Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, was responsible for disseminating so much knowledge. And I think one lesson that you and I can take with us to our home is that when we go back and when we reflect upon the history of Imam Sadiq, one thing that you can take is that the knowledge that he has imparted, knowledge that he has given to the whole ummah, I think it's important for us that the efforts that he has put in, we take a little bit out of it and we try to increase our knowledge too. So with this, inshallah, we end our lecture. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Any questions? Anyone has any question? Uh, yeah, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Yeah, so I had two questions. The first question is that um, which battle did um, uh, the cousin Jafar die in, who was like the brother of Imam Ali? Which battle did he die in? Uh, battle of uh, Mota. Wait, Mota? Yeah, yeah. Mota, okay. Jange Mota, yeah. And um, uh, uh, like uh, we know that. Abu Hanifa and other famous um, uh, Sunni scholars uh, were the students of Imam Jafar Sadiq uh, So, um, is there any proof from like the books of Ahl Sunnah, like the major books of Ahl Sunnah? Of course. And, yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. It's a really wonderful question, Muhammad, and I'm glad that you brought up uh, this question. And honestly, it slipped out of my mind completely, and I should have mentioned it, but uh, Jazakallah for bringing this thing up. Uh, yes, so Abu Hanifa and Malik bin Anas, two of the famous you know, Sunnis, they generally have four big scholars that they uh, adhere to. One of them is Abu Hanifa, second of them is Malik bin Anas, third of them is Shafi'i, Muhammad bin Idris is Shafi'i, fourth of them is Ahmad bin Hanbal. And other scholars were there too. So one of them also included Sufyan al -Thawri. So Sufyan al -Thawri, Abu Hanifa, and Malik bin Anas, all of them were the students of whom? Were the students of Imam Sadiq, alayhi salatu wassalam. And some of them were the students of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, alayhi salatu wassalam too. So that's why Abu Hanifa has this famous saying that says, Lawla sanatan lahalaka nu'man. That if it wouldn't be for the two years that I studied under Imam Muhammad al Baqir and under Imam Jafar al Sadiq, I would have perished. The same way his caliph would say to Amir al Mu'minin, Lawla aliyun la that if it wouldn't be for Amir al Mu'minin, Umar would have perished, right? So, mashallah, you see, like the Imams that we follow are the ones that gave the knowledge. And the people that follow other Imams are the ones that took the knowledge. And it's a whole debate that they took the knowledge the right way or not. But there are some books that you can go through, inshallah. Um, you know, like um, if you go through the books of Shibli Nomani, Shibli Nomani is a really uh, famous scholar in India, in Pakistan and India. You know, he was from India and he has written some books about, uh, even he has a whole book called An Nu'man. And he is discussing about the biography of Abu Hanifa in it. Abu Hanifa's his name was Norman bin Thabit, right? So he has a whole book called Norman. You can go through it. And there are plenty of other books within the Sunnism, inshallah. If you need, I can give you the scans, inshallah. But I think Shibli Nomani, the reason I mentioned him was that his book is available in Urdu. Some of his books are translated into English too. Uh, like one of his books, I think the book that he wrote on Omar. That book is translated into English too, named Farooq, right? Farooq the Great, that's the same. So, inshallah, if you can um, get hold of the English version of it, I'm not sure. The book, An Nu'man, if not, then I'm, I'll, inshallah, I'll try to give you the scans. And there are some other Sunni scholars too. If I remember correctly, Shah Abdulaziz al Dehlawi, right? This is a person that wrote a whole book against Shias. His the name of the book is Tofa Ithna Ashriya. Which means a gift to the Shias, right? So a huge book against the Shias. I think, I think if I remember correctly, he also mentions in his book that um, 
Abu Hanifa was a student of Imam Sadiq والسلام, and all the other Rijal scholars too that have written on the topic of Rijal, they have mentioned too that Abu Hanifa would come and Abu Hanifa would get the knowledge from Imam Sadiq Okay, Jazakallah. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Sajjad. Yeah. I have one question. So I heard this. I have heard the story about Imam Jafar Sadiq and one of his companions. Our pledge of allegiance and our all the devotion is for the Ahl Bayt Ali Musalam. So in our mind, within our hearts, we do think that we love Ahl Bayt Ali Musalam the way they should be loved. Not the way they should be loved, but at least to the bare minimum, we love them. But sometimes the problem comes in actions, right? So yes, we claim ourselves as Shias. We claim ourselves as someone that loves Ahl Bayt. But are we Shias? Are we the one that loves Ahl Bayt? That's a question that should come into the mind of all the ones that are listening to this lecture and also to the people that, uh, you know, that might listen it later. Or, you know, they should go back and reflect upon this thing. That Shias is someone who follows someone. That person is called Shia of Fulan. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam was called who? Was called the Shia of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. Why? Because he would follow Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam both in letter and both in spirit. Proper following. That is the literal translation of Shia. The problem is that we claim ourselves Shias, but do we really care about the teachings of any faith? Ali Bayt wants us to, you know, to go and get the knowledge. How much of us take that burden of taking the knowledge of and getting the knowledge? Ali Bayt wants us to pray five times. How much? How many of us generally we miss our Fajr Salah? Ali Bayt wants us to fast thirty days if we are capable. How many of us are actually fasting all thirty days? I mean, like maybe one or two of you, or maybe all of you might be doing. But my question is more general then to the people that are listening to it right now. So the thing is that the Shias are the only one that follow whatever they have within their heart. If they are not following whatever is in their hearts, so then there is a discrepancy between whatever they claim and what whatever they do. So this is the same thing that happened that a person came from Khorasan, if I'm not wrong, and he was saying from Khorasan or from, you know, from the Iran Iraq border, a little bit confused here, but he came from one of the areas that included a lot of Shias. They claimed themselves as Shias. So he claimed and he said, Mola, we should rose up, we should fight against these tyrannical rulers, this regime that's doing so much. So Imam said, okay, that's the thing. Uh, you should go and you should go into this pot that's a burning pot, right? You should go inside it if you truly claim that you are Shia. So that person, you know, he was shocked and he was just like, my God, uh, Mala, do you, do you really mean what you're saying? So mom said, okay, never mind. Okay, just be here. Then there is another companion that came in. And that companion, you know, he came in, he has slippers with him and he was coming like this. And Imam said that, oh, Fulan, go and go under that hard part, right? He, without even questioning, he went into it. And that person who was talking to Imam, he was, you know, completely taken, blown away, completely taken away. He couldn't even concentrate on whatever he was talking with Imam. And Imam was just talking to him like the way naturally and normally Imam would talk. And then when his concern got higher, then Imam took him. And then when Imam took him to the place, he saw the person that was being instructed to go into the fire. That fire became, you know, just a way for Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. It became whole. It became, uh, you know, a salvation piece. That fire became a piece of salvation for that person too. And that person was reading the Quran. So Imam said, can you tell me how many of Shias we had like this? 
So the person said, Mona, we don't even have two or three people like this. So just to tell you that, you know, like claiming ourselves as Shias is one thing and actually acting upon it is different. So one lesson that we can take from it is that whatever things that you come across, whatever imams are saying, try to act upon it because by you acting upon it, you would get closer to the imam of your time than anything else. Jazakallah. I don't think we have any more questions, so we can just. No, I just wanted to ask uh, something since we have a number of students here. So, uh, in in near future, if you people like to uh, discuss a topic of your choice, I think uh, the administration would like to accommodate that. So I was just thinking maybe there are some uh, special or specific topic which the students would like to discuss if Brother Jerry has time and he can give some time. Um, I would like you people to come up with some topic which you think that you have a lot of questions about. It can be related to fake also, to history also, to the clock also, anything else also. Would yes, that sir. be... Uh, Fine with you, Brother Jerry. Yeah, it's a, it's a good idea, inshallah. Um, whatever topic they might have. Uh, but we really genuinely want people to, and the students to take interest and generally any topic that is of primary concern for them, I think they should bring forward, of course. Uh, one, more, uh, one more clarification regarding Imam Jafar, Sadiq Ali Salam. Like we see uh, in our Western world, like uh, you had mentioned also that Imam Jafar Salik al Islam has uh, done a lot of work regarding science and all that. So we see some uh, like he's being portrayed as uh, as a more as a scientist and all that. And if uh, we research about him on the uh, uh, you know internet also, so we see that uh, there are. Uh, he has been quoted a lot as a scientist. So I have just said this little concern that is it okay to introduce imams as scientists or as master of some uh, other knowledge? Uh, would that be a question on their level of uh, ismat or the level of position? I hope you are getting what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. So sometimes uh, the way we uh, introduce an imam, it becomes a really specific understanding of the imam as if he was uh, only known for his sciences or you know the spiritual part of it gets missed right so i mean like the way i want to introduce imam is that he was the master or he was the teacher of the scholars that came afterwards him you know be it the people that have done so much in the field of fiqh people that have done so much in the field of theology people that might have done so much in the field of chemistry in the field of philosophy, in field of like different other kind of fields, in field of the ulum of Quran. You know, when I was trying to mention Jabir bin Hayyan, obviously, uh, I was really, really running short of time. So I had to mention one of the students. But if you go to the students that Imam had, Imam had a specialized student of fiqh who was named as Zawara. Imam had a special student of Kalam. His name was Hisham bin Salim. Imam had a special student in the field of Imam, and his name was Hisham bin Hakam. Imam had a special field in the field of Arabic, his name was Himran bin Ayyum. Imam had a special person in the field of the ulum of Quran, his name was Aban bin Taqlab. So you see, like, Imam had different students who were specializing in their own field. So Imam was giving, he was more like, you see, like, you have, you have a PhD uh, instructor who is basically entertaining and helping like this is already uh, ex this is example that is not necessarily the right example but just want you to understand a little bit that since we someone if someone is doing PhD right they would have an instructor that would continuously guide them towards the research likewise Imam Salam, you could take a little bit like uh, that PhD instructor that were helping the huge scholars in their specific field of research. So you see that if I would probably introduce Imam as the master of the masters, someone like that, right? And Jabat bin Hayyan is only a portion of that ocean of knowledge that Imam has given, right? 
The, but the problem sometimes I could understand, sister, is that when you're talking to a non-Muslim or someone who doesn't believe in God, so sometimes the difficult part is that how would you introduce them to, you know, to Imam Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam? Because we would go into the spirituality a lot. They would say that there are so many spiritual scholars that are already there. What is the thing that Imam has given me something that I could take off? Something that would help me in my daily life. So sometimes I would say that while you're trying to convince them, there should always be a starting point. And that starting point would always be to give them something that is beneficial to them. So you'll probably start with this chemistry thing. You would probably start with Jabba bin Hayyan, someone like that. And then you go further and further. You can go into the field of philosophy. You can go into the field of theology, even though this is a primary concern. But if we would jump up straight to the Quran, if we would jump straight to Arabic or to Fiqh, so person might not only might not even believe in being a religion, right? So it's, I mean, like it's a difficult slope that we have to go through. But inshallah, if we would introduce him in a more generic way than specific way, then I think it will be better for all of us. Jazakallah, brother. Makes sense. Jazakallah. Are there any more questions, or are we ready for the Imam Zamana? Yeah, I think. Uh, we're ready for Dua Imam oh. yeah. So if, if everyone can take a turn on their mic and recite Zara uh, Dua Imam Zamana, please. Bismillah. Shalom. 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 Shalom